The play by Catherine Matsfield. You are very snug in here, piped old Mr. Woody Field, and he peered out of great green leather armchair by his friend the boss test as a baby peers out of its pram. His talk was over. It was time for him to be off, but he did not want to go. Since he had retired since his stroke, the wife and the girls keep him boxed up in the house every day of the week except Tuesday. On Tuesday, he was dressed and brushed and allowed to cut back to the city, though what he did there the wife and the girls couldn't imagine. Made a nuisance of himself to his friends, they suppose, well, perhaps so, all the same we cling to our past pleasures, as the tree clings to its last leaves. So there sat Woody Field smoking a cigar and staring almost greedily at the boss, who rolled in his chair thought Rosie five years older than him, and still going strong. Still at helm, it did one good to see him. Peacefully, admiringly, the old voice added, It's snug in here, upon my word. Yes, it is comfortable enough, agreed the boss, and he flipped the financial times with a paper knife. As a matter of fact, he was proud of his mom. He liked to have it admired, especially by Woody Field. It gave him a feeling of deep, solid satisfaction to be planted dear in the midst of it in full view of what prey old figure in the muffler. I have it done up lately, he explained, as he explained for the past how many weeks. New carpet, and he pointed to the bright red carpet with a pattern of large white rings. New furniture, and he noted, towards the massive bookcase of the table with legs like twisted treacle. Electric heating, he waved, almost exultantly towards the pipe transparent purely sausages glowing so softly in the tilted copper pan. But he did not draw old Woody Field's attention to the photograph over the table of a gray looking boy in uniform, standing one of those spectral photographers with photographer storm clouds behind him. It was not new, it had been there for over six years. There was something I wanted to tell you, said old Woody Field, and his eyes grew dim remembering. Now what is it? I had it in my mind when I started out this morning. His hands began to tremble and patches of red showed above his breath. Pulled old chap, he's on his last pins, told the boss, and feeling kindly, he winked at the old man and said jokingly, I tell you what, I got a little drop of something there that do you good before you go, you go out into the cold again. It's beautiful stuff. It wouldn't hurt a child. He took the key of his watch chain, unlocked a chopboard below his desk, and drew a port at dark. Dark, squat bottle, that's the medicine, and the and said he, the man from whom I got it told me, on the street cutie, it came from the cellars at Windsor Castle. Old Woody Field's mouth fell open at the sight. He couldn't have looked more surprised if the boss had produced a rabbit. It's whiskey, ain't it? He piped feebly. The boss turned the bottle and lovingly showed him the label whiskey it was. Do you know, said he peering up the boss wonderingly, they won't let me touch it at home, and he looked as though he was going to cry. Ah, there we know a bit more than the ladies, cried the boss, swooping across for two tumblers and stood on the table with the water bottle and pouring a generous finger into each. Drink it down. It do you good and don't put any water with it. It's sacrilege to temple with stuff like this. Ah, he tossed off his, pulled out his handkerchief, hastily wiped his mouth touch, and cooked an eye at the old woody field, who was rolling his in his chops. The old man swallowed, was a silent moment, and then he faintly said, It's naughty. But it warned him. It crept into his chill old brain, he remembered. That was it, he said, heaving himself at, out of his chair. I thought you'd like to know. The girls were in Belgium last week, having to look for the poor Regis grave. 
and they happen to came across your voice. They quite near each other, it seems. Old Woody feel fast. But the boss made no reply. Only a quiver in his eyelid showed that he heard. The girls were delighted with the way the place is kept, piped the old boys. Beautifully look after. Couldn't be better if they were at home. You'd not been across, Javier? No. No, for various reasons the boss had not been across. Their minds of it quavered old woody field, and it all as neat as a garden, flowers growing on the on on all the grades, nice broad paths. It was plain for his boys how much he liked a nice broad path. The pause came again, then the old man brightened wonderfully. Do you know what the hotel made the girls pay for a pot of jam? He piped. Turn round, shabbily. I call it. It was a little pot. So Gertrude says no. Bigger than a half crown. And she hadn't taken more than a spoonful when they charged her ten francs. Gertrude bought the pot away with her to teach him a lesson. Quite right, too. It's raining on our feelings. They think because we're over there having a look around when ready to pay anything. That was it. And he turned towards the door. Quite right, quite right, cried the boss. Though what was quite right, he hadn't the least idea. He came around by his desk, followed the shuffling footstep to the door, and saw the old fellow out where Woodyfield was gone. For a long moment, the boss stayed, staring at nothing, while the gray-haired office messenger watching him dodge in and out of his cubby hole like a dog that expect to be taken for a run. Then, I'll see nobody for a half hour, Macy, said the boss. Understand nobody at all. Very, very good, sir. The door shut at the beam heavy step. Recross the bright carpet, the pot body plumped down in the spring chair and leaning forward. The boss covered his face with his hands. He wanted, he intended, he had arranged to weep. It was been a terrible shock to him when old Woody Fields sprang that remark upon, he, upon him about the boy's graves. It was exactly as though the earth had opened and he had seen the boy lying there with Woody Fields' girl, staring down at him. For it was strange, although over six years has passed away, the boss never thought of the boy except as lying unchanged, unblemished in his uniform, asleep forever. My son, groaned the boss, but no tears came yet. In the past, in the first months and even years after the boy's death, he had only to say those words to be overcome such grief by that nothing short of a violent fit of weeping could relieve him. Time he had declared then, he had told everybody, could make no difference. Other men perhaps might recover but leave their loss down, but not he. How was it possible? His boy was only son. Ever since his birth, the boss, wa the boss had worked at building up his business for him. It had no meaning if it was not for the boy. Life itself had come to have no other meaning. How on earth could he have slave denied himself, keep going all those years without the promise forever before him of the boy stepping into his shoes and carrying up where he left off? And that, and that promise had been so near, being fulfilled, full, being fulfilled. The boy had been in the office learning the ropes for a year before the war. Every morning they had started off together. They had come back by the same train. And what congratulation he had received as a boy's father. No wonder he had taken it marvelously. At his no, at his pa, at to his popularity, with the staff, every man jack of them down to old Macy couldn't make enough the boy 
of the boy. And he wasn't in the in the least spoiled. No, he was just his bright, natural self with the right word for everybody. With that boyish look and his habit of saying, simply splendid. But all that was over and done, with as though that it would never had happened. The day had come when Maisie had handed him the telegram that bought the whole place crashing about his head. Deeply regret to inform you, and he had left the office a broken man, with his life ruins. Six years ago, six years, how quickly time passed. It might have happened yesterday. The boss took his hand from his face. He was puzzled. Something seemed to be wrong with him. He wasn't feeling as he wanted to feel. He decided to get up and have a look at the boy's photograph. But it wasn't a favorite photograph of his. The expression was unnatural. It was cold, even stern looking. The boy had never looked like that. At that moment, the boss noticed that a fly had fallen into his broad ink pot and was trying feebly but desperate to clamber out again. Help, help, said those struggling legs, but the side of the ink pot were wet and slippery. It fell back again and, and began to swim. The boss, the boss took, out, took up a pen, picked the fly out of the ink, and shook it on the piece of floating paper. For a fraction of a second, it lay still on the dark patch that oozed around it. Then the front legs waved took hold and pulling its small, sudden body up, it began to immense task of cleaning the ink from its wings. Over and under, over and under, went a leg along a wing, as the stone goes under and over and under the side. Then there was a pause, while the fly, seeming to stand on the on the tips of its toes, tried to expand first one wing and then the other, it succeeded at last, and sitting down, it began like a min like a minute cut to clean its face. Now what now one could imagine that the little front legs rub against each other tightly, joyfully. The horrible danger was over. It had escaped. It was ready for life again. But then the boss had an idea. He flung out his pen bang into the ink, leaned his stick wrist on the bloating paper, and the fly tried its wing down, came a he great heavy blot. What would it make out of that? What indeed? The little bigger seemed absolute cold, stunned, and afraid to move because of what would happen next. But then, as if faintly, it dragged himself forward. The front legs swayed, cold, cut hold, and more slowly this time, the task began from the beginning. He was plucky little devil, thought the boss, and he felt a real admiration for the fly's courage. That was the way to tackle things. That was the right spirit. Never say die. It was only a question of but the fly had again finished its laborious task, and the boss had just time to refill his pen, to shake fear and square on the new clean body yet another dark drop. What about it this time? A painful moment for suspense followed. But behold, the front leg were again waving. The boss felt a rush of relief. He leaned over the fly and said to it, Tenderly, you are for little B, and he actually had a brilliant notion of breathing onto it, help to drying the process. All the same, there was n something timid and weak about its effort now, and the boss decided that this time should be the last, as he dipped the pen deep into the ink pot. It was the last blood fell on the soap floating paper and the dragonfly lay in the lay in it and did not stir the back legs were stuck of the body the front legs were not to be seen come on said the boss look sharp 
and he stirred it it with his pen in vain. Nothing happened or was likely to happen. The fly was dead. The boss lifted the corpse on the end and of the paper knife and flung it to the waste paper basket. But such a grinning feeling of wretchedness seized him that he felt positively pretending pretend he started towards the pre towards and pressed the bell for Missy. Bring me some fresh bloating paper, he said sternly, and look sharp about it. And while the old dog padded away, he fell to wondering what it was he had been thinking about before. What was it? It was he took out his handkerchief and passed it inside his collar. For the life of him, he could not remember.